I'm Sky Borgman. I'm the director and a producer of the new Netflix documentary, Girl in the Picture. In 2002, a friend sent me a photograph. It was a picture of a little girl, her father. The more you looked at the picture and the more you looked at her, you could see something was terribly wrong. The only person that knew her real identity was her father. Franklin Floyd had been a fugitive for almost two decades. He robbed a bank. He had a history of violence. He was an expert and concealed his identity. He had a daughter, Sharon Marshall. She wanted to go to Georgia Tech, be an aerospace engineer. I remember the phone call, and she said she was pregnant, but Daddy won't let me go to college now. We discovered that they changed their names. He took her around to strip clubs to make a living for him. There's a big question here. What happened to Sharon Marshall? It's an investigative journalist. You try to get down to the truth. All this information, very simple to analyze, and we had a real problem. This is more than just a crime story. Who is this girl? She went by many names. We had a portrait of very different people. This beautiful young woman was trapped in evil. She was stuck and didn't know how to get out. What happened? And who the hell is she? This is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week it is my pleasure to welcome award-winning filmmaker Sky Borgman, the director and producer of the Netflix feature documentary Girl in the Picture, which released on July 6th. In this film, a woman found dying by a road leaves behind a son, a man claiming to be her husband, and a mystery that unfolds like a nightmare. Join us as we learn more about this incredibly tragic tale and the incredible story of how the mystery was eventually solved 25 years later. Sky is also the director of another fascinating and compelling true crime hit, 2017's Abducted in Plain Sight. And we ask Sky, what is the secret to her success? Sky, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Good. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be sitting here talking to you today. Well, it's great to have you on. Uh, just to remind our listeners, we're uh, speaking with Sky Borgman, the uh, director and producer of Girl in the Picture. Uh, it's on Netflix, a feature documentary releasing on July 6th. So congratulations. I'm sure this will be a fixture in the Netflix uh, top 10 once it, uh, once it releases. So congratulations again on, 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 uh, uh, on, on getting this uh, to this stage. And um, maybe we can start off. I, you know, there's going to be a lot of, um, I hate to say it, I think I'm going to end up using the word spoiler alert quite a bit, but I just want to say, maybe you can get us started, because I imagine most of our listeners will not have seen the, uh, the, the, the documentary yet. But what is Girl in the Picture all about? So Girl in the Picture is about a young woman who lived many different lives, had many different identities, and we sort of follow her journey that really begins with her death and unravel who she was throughout time, unravel the people that she met along the way, uh, some better, some worse, and kind of look at a relationship between her and who she believes is her father. We come to find out that's not necessarily the case, but he certainly is the man that raised her from, from a very young age. Um, it's a, it's a crime documentary, but it's very much a documentary that looks at who this woman was, who mm. Sharon Marshall was, who um, the people that she impacted and, and the world that she left behind and the impact that she made in, in a very short period of time. I mean, she was 20 years old when she died. And so it's really, really victim forward and um, really kind of a beautiful, hopefully, tribute to this to this young woman and to victims everywhere. Yeah, mm. I think, well... I'm Having having seen it, I com- I completely agree. I think um, since let's let's focus. I mean, if we can t- focus a little bit more on her. I mean, at the time of her death, I guess she's known as Tonya Hughes, uh, but as you said, many aliases. But she's this. What comes across? Uh, maybe this is a spoiler alert. I don't know, but uh, she is this caring soul in this incredibly intelligent young woman who touched a lot of lives in her sh- very short period, uh, short life. 
Yeah, and I think honestly, that's one of the things that was most impactful to me and what drew me the most to telling this story was was the young woman herself and how her actions and the way that she existed in this world and the way that she affected people both while she was alive and after she was dead. Like, it was very interesting because she mm. somehow had this, this, I don't know, ability to, to reach back from, from after she was dead to really affect people, affect law enforcement, to really try to figure out what happened to her. Um, her friends who knew her in high school remembered her deeply far, mm. far, far beyond high school. And that, you know, I mean, I've, I'm sure we all have friends from high school that, you know, they show up on our Facebook feeds or, or they reach out to you and you're like, who is that person? I know the name sounds kind of familiar, but I've lost track after, you know, a few 20 years or so, 30 years. And so you're kind of going, who is that person? But she, she made some really, really deep friendships in the short period of time that she, she knew these people. And that was, that was very intriguing to me, her, her power over all of us. Yeah, and I mean that comes yeah as you say it came across with the interviews with her high school friends, uh, the law enforcement officials, the guy who kept a picture of well I think uh, was it her or her son actually but uh, kept a picture oh. both yeah. up on his you know until the day he retired that's what he looked at every morning when he came into work, um, yeah. so and all walks of life different she was headed for if not for all the tragic events she was probably headed for be an aeronautical engineer and a high flyer, if you will, and uh, yet um, touched those even when she had to, you know, in the lower points, um, I guess, as, as well, in terms of the different people she met and all the different walks of life she, she went in. So, uh, but this all kind of, I mean, I guess the current of the start, the start of the story is this uh, un horrible thing that happened with, with her son, isn't it? Uh, Michael. I mean, yeah. it, it starts with his kidnapping, at least in terms of how this all starts coming to light. Yeah, in terms of law enforcement and, and when people s sort of in that sort of universe really started looking at this story, there was no crime that had been reported before she died, really. Even her death was considered, mm. for the most part, a hit and run and accidental. They were never able to prove anything. But really when law enforcement started looking at this case in a much deeper way was when when her son was kidnapped at gunpoint out of his elementary school um and he had been in foster care you know and that's really when when the fbi got involved and in a very very big way started looking at who this person was and who the man who, who kidnapped michael was and that's that's when his world really started to unravel and when her world really started to become clear but it took many, many years to, to really find out the truth about who Sharon Marshall, Tanya Hughes, who, who that woman was. Yeah, I mean, and, and exactly. But I guess as uh, the, I mean, the other sort of main character, if you will, is then the, the, as you said, the man purportedly to be her, well, at one time husband, then actual father, uh, we think, or most people thought, uh, is this guy who I guess we, know as ultimately as Franklin Delano Floyd. Um, and maybe we can, without putting him forward, I mean, he is obviously, um, he's got many aliases, but one MO, which is seems to be murder and mayhem. Um, I mean, he's, uh, I, that's when, I guess, I imagine, we, we, we were actually talking with some of your colleagues beforehand about, uh, I think I used the term jaw-dropping, but it must have been sort of jaw-dropping for the, um, for the investigators as they started unpeeling this onion and finding out all the twists and turns to this story. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, look, they were faced with, with looking at this man with so many aliases and they really had to put it together. And uh, let's face it. I mean, he was a professional criminal and he was very, very good at it. He was very good at, you know, as soon as somebody started figuring out kind of who he was or that there was something a little bit off, he could make a fake ID and and leave and start a whole new life in another state. And and so the states, you know, especially at that period of time in the, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even even into the 90s, really, 
you know, they weren't talking state to state. They still, you know, there's still sort of problems with that. And so he knew how to work the system. He'd been in, in the justice, you know, in the incarcerated before. And so he knew a lot about how, how to dodge people and how to sort of work around things. So he was a master at that. Yeah. I mean, as someone who moved states and was worried about having to pay a parking ticket for my last, last place where I lived, I know in the nineties, I mean, I can imagine, you know, and it did catch up with me, but I mean, it's, yeah, I think, um, it is amazing. It always, I think, amazes us in, in that, yes, I agree, it's a different time, but how do you, you know, how, you have to get new social security numbers. You have to do all kinds of things. How do you get this to happen? But he, he just seemed to be a master at, at this. And ultimately, it tripped him up, too, especially with the social security numbers. Um, you know, it really ends up tripping him up. And I, I mean, it, I guess, ultimately it has to catch up with you. I mean, you know, when you lie so much and then you have to keep track of all those lies, ultimately you just fall down and and that's what he did. And that's what, what really led to sort of the domino effect that ended up getting him caught. Okay. Now, um, eventually, as you've said, and we're not, we won't, I mean, again, spoiler alerts, but we won't go into the, I guess, the detail. I'll let you lead on this, to be honest with you, but we will be releasing this about the time that the, the uh, film releases. Um, eventually, um, uh, Tonya Hughes, Sharon Marshall, her true identity does come to light. Now, this is, uh, as you said, it, it took many years for this to happen. And what, maybe we can say something about the people who behind, um, uh, you know, this, this story that took decades to, to find. I mean, it's uh, um, a lot of you, I guess what you're showing is uh, our reveal is, re was, uh, you know, people like Matt Birkbeck would have been involved but how did this you know it was an interesting mix of people sort of amateur investigators investigative journalists and fbi who've who've got us to this point where we actually find out who sharon really really was yeah matt birkbeck was was critical in it and and joe fitzpatrick was critical i mean joe spent many many years of his career while he was still an active um special agent in the fbi really trying to figure out who this woman was and, and what happened to Michael, her son. And, and even after his retirement, you know, he, he kept in contact with people and he, it was a personal, it was personal to him. He wanted, mm. he wanted to give some sort of closure, I guess, to himself, to people who were involved, to people who knew Sharon and, and, and it was him. And then Matt Birkbeck becoming involved in the story, becoming interested in the story, who were then able to find out what really truly happened to fill in a lot of the a lot of the holes it was Matt Birkbeck who was really able to fill in a lot of the holes of what had happened to Sharon and ultimately was was a huge factor in finding out what her true identity was and and that in large part too it was a very present day thing and very much because of, of a lot of armchair detectives sort of coming in a lot of people really interested in the story so it goes even beyond the law enforcement that Sharon was able to reach, but her story impacted so many people through, you know, social media, through digital means. And then people were giving a lot of information and trying to come up with clues. And ultimately we are able to find her true identity and even, you know, go a little bit further than that and find out some more information. Yeah, in indeed. Um, and just pure, I mean, I hate to use the term luck, but just pure luck. Someone happen happening to see a photo or, a friend recommending the book and saying, wait, you know, or something like that, you know, that was just, just incredible. Yeah. I mean, finding the book, seeing the photo and even, you know, how we tracked down sort of another, another crime that, that Franklin Floyd committed was law enforcement communicating with each other over state lines and kind of putting pieces together and going above and beyond and working with all these different jurisdictions to try to find out who this woman was and what happened to her son. Okay. Uh, how did you become involved with this with this project? So I became involved, it, it's funny because it was a long project when you think of back before COVID, which is when I first became involved in the project. Uh, Jimmy Fox from, from All Three Media reached out to me and uh, they were talking with Netflix and they came to me with this idea of this podcast, film, collaboration, partnership. And I thought it was a really great idea because after I read both of Matt's books, there's a lot of story to tell. There's a lot of really amazing detailed story to tell. And, and to do that in a feature length documentary was challenging. Um, and so this idea of the podcast 
being able to sort of go into and tell more details about various elements of the story was really appealing to me and that these two mm. could sort of be in production at the same time. And it's not really, you know, the podcast isn't sort of picking up where the film left off, but it really is a companion piece to this film. And, and I love the idea of that. And I love the idea of, of telling Sharon's story and getting, finding the humanity and, and really getting that out in the film. And so it all happened before COVID and then COVID hit and everything got stretched out and delayed and, and filming got delayed yeah. until probably about a year later. And, uh, okay. and then we were sort of full steam ahead. Okay. I mean, you, you mentioned the podcast. I mean, is this something that we're going to be seeing increasingly? I mean, there, it's not the first time. I've I think we already out. are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we already are seeing it increasingly. I mean, people, people are drawn to, to these longer format stories. I mean, even, even looking at where the documentaries are, you know, we've gone from, from feature length, 90 minute to, to two hour documentaries to limited right. series but people want the detail. They want the time to live with these people. And I think, yeah. you know, we're seeing, I, I've seen a lot more of the sort of, you know, filmmakers perspective on, on what's behind a documentary, but to expand on the actual story, I think podcasts have, have really, I mean, there's some incredible podcasts out there doing these documentary style mm -hmm. storytelling. And I think people are drawn to, to the details and to having as much information as they can. Okay. Um, I think that actually gives us a, um, a, a, a chance to give our listeners a quick early break. But we'll be right back with uh, Sky Borgman, the uh, director and producer of Girl in the Picture, uh, releasing on Netflix on July 6th. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning filmmaker Sky Borgman, director and producer of Girl in the Picture. Uh, releases on Netflix on July 6th. It's a documentary feature. Uh, we've been talking, obviously, about Girl in the Picture. Um, this, obviously, is not your first true crime doc and probably not your... Uh, not won't certainly won't be your first uh, hit true crime doc. I mean, what is what's the secret to your success? Because I, I feel like um, I mean, as someone who's now seen the films and this film in particular, I mean, it's let's face it. There's true crime, and then there's there's something about the story that makes it takes it to another level. Um, is it about picking the right stories? Is it is it more than just storytelling? What do you, what do you think is the key? Because it's a it's it's an, an extremely compelling watch. I think for me, it's it's picking a story that really resonates with me. Um, I I definitely enjoy stories that I don't completely understand that have a lot of layers to them that have a lot of complexity and it takes me a minute to kind of. Mm -hmm at least attempt to figure out how or why something happened. I can't always figure out exactly how or why something happened, but I like, I like stories that I'm not completely certain of, of how things evolve. And I think too, I'm mostly interested in telling human stories. And I think those are just, crime gives us the full spectrum of humanity from the very, very best to the very, very worst of people. And, and so I think really sort of unraveling the, the, the human condition and, and what drives us to do the different things we do, how we come back from certain tragedies or traumas, that's, that's really interesting to me. And also just looking at stories where there may not be, you know, a very sort of typical trajectory of how things happen, things that sort of take little detours and, and people who do things that are unexpected and interesting people. Those, those are the stories that interest me. And those are the ones that, that really compel me. I look at, you spend a lot of years on stories, you know, it's mm. for me now we're, we're going on almost three years that I've been, that I've been with girl in the picture. And so you have to, you have to be connected to it personally and you have to have that drive to kind of tell these stories. And do you, I mean, do you go into it thinking this is going to be a, a, a documentary thriller or is it just the story plays out in front of you as you're working on it and you're that's the best way of uh i mean telling the story while also being respectful as you say to the victims and friends and, and family members i think it's a combination of both i mean i always go into i always go into a story having a uh like the first steps are really kind of knowing what the building blocks are to the story and going do we do i have the pieces 
you know, that I can put the story together? Do I have those? And by pieces, I don't even mean beginning, middle and end. I mean, are there characters that are complex? Are there ideas that are that are divisive? Are there interesting moments that that are curious? And, and those are the things I'm looking for in a story. But ultimately, it's 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 a totally different story when you're doing the research on it. And then you go out and film it and it becomes something completely different because people say different things. And then you just are meeting people in person and they change your perspective a little bit. And then, and then it changes in post. So I feel like I always have a great perspective and, a, and an approach to things when I go into it. But ultimately the story really does dictate how it's told and, and, and why it's told and, and where it goes and how it goes together. And it's, you know, this collaboration with a, a huge team of people. I mean, mm. you know, I mean, we're sitting here, it's just, just you and me talking about this story and I'm listed as the director, but but I Matt Birkbeck was an incredible partner in this. He knew so many people. I mean, our editing, our editor, Fernanda was incredible. Producer, Danny Sloan. I mean, it's all these people sort of coming together and and Jimmy with the production company and Jimmy Stowe for the music. I mean, it's this team of people mm. that, that really sort of just comes into this project and brings it brings it to life, gives it the life that Sharon deserves. Yeah. And, and along, and, and, and I know you would also add the, the subjects themselves. Cause I think in, in, in this documentary of, of, I mean, it's, it's true with all most documentaries, but especially in this one, I mean, the, the memories, the vivid memories and retelling that everyone is able to give and the, ch the fact that most of the people are still around even this many years later. I mean, it was just, uh, um, that gives it so much life as, as well. And that so many people wanted to talk, which is not usually the case yeah, of stories exactly. like this, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's hard to talk about this stuff and it's hard to go on camera and be public and talk about a lot of these really awful, terrible feelings. Yeah. And, and there were so many people. I mean, I think, you know, at the beginning, I've had 35 people on my interview list. I mean, they really wanted to, to talk. And you go, it's in a feature length documentary, 35 people is almost too many, you know, and what do you need yeah. to tell these stories? But everybody wanted to talk about Sharon. And and it really isn't always the case because people, they, it's hard, yeah. it's hard yeah. to talk about this stuff. Yeah. And so and I appreciate that. That's, that's such a big part of it, right? I appreciate everybody. I appreciate the relationships that Matt Birkbeck yeah. had and kept for 20 years with everybody and how open they were to having me and a team of people come in and set these big cameras up and shine a light on them and say, yeah. please tell me your story and to have them tell it so eloquently and so beautifully and so heart-wrenchingly. It's just such an honor to be in the room with yeah. I mean, that's a very good point. We're not talking about professional actors. These are people who've probably never been on camera in their lives and they are just, uh, it, it, I was blown away by that actually. Oh. I was too. And I, and I always am, you know, I always am when I'm, I, it's, it's why I do this job. You know, it's why I love documentary films because it just gives me the opportunity to meet people that I would never meet if I was, if I was working somewhere else, you know, I meet people that I'm, you know, that work at these different places that live these different lives that have had these different experiences and these different pasts and these different futures. And it's just such an honor that they're, that they're willing to share themselves with, with me and then with the world. Um, yeah, and I guess, and given the subject matter, it also, uh, at least for me, uh, uh, strengthens my view of my fellow men and women, you know, in terms of there are these people out there who are, I mean, especially the law enforcement, all of them just kept plugging ahead, trying to yeah. find, you know, for decades, uh, trying to get to, to the, the root of this story. Um, I mean, we were talking also about, um, you know, how, you, how the film plays out and everything, but are you ever, I mean, in this film particular, were the things that surprised you? Did you get to some places that you weren't expecting to go? I definitely, I mean, look, I, at the beginning, there's, there's two books, right, out on yeah. this subject. So you kind of sort of, you can read the two books and you're like, we have all the answers. It's done, right? There are right. two books published. But even when we were on, on sets and filming and Matt was with us for every, every interview that we did, and there were just little details that somebody would mention and we'd go, wait a minute, you know, that ties into this, that ties into this, that ties into this. And, mm -hmm. and there were certainly things that we, that we learned um, after we were wrapped while we were still filming that, um, that led to, to more information. Some of which appears in the documentary and other that's, that's sort of just not meant to be sort of shared publicly. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. Um, I respect your wishes on that. I mean, what was, what was the main challenge you think in making this? The main challenge was really, uh, I think maybe getting all, getting everybody involved, that getting, giving them the time that they deserve to sort of talk about this woman. Um, and look, it was easy. It was easy to love Sharon. We all loved mm -hmm. Sharon, right? Um, it was very easy to do that. I think it was giving the people the time they deserve to tell their story and telling the story from the documentary perspective in it's an hour and 40 minutes long, roughly. Yeah. And so getting all of those story points in there and, and leaving and deciding what to leave out and what to not include that we could then go into detail in the podcast, but that, that was hard. I mean, there were times, you know, I mean, I think our first mm -hmm. look, our first cut was, like five hours long and it was had a lot of information but really deciding what to, to leave out of it was a challenge so did you consider doing a series instead of a, a feature we had yeah at some point you know there were some conversations about it but ultimately we all felt that the document the feature documentary format was the best one to tell this particular story and some of it had to do with the podcast relationship but really yeah. you know looking at this looking at this woman's arc in life it just felt like the feature was the way to go. And I, and I, you know, there were times where I'm like, gosh, we really could make three episodes. We could have one be Tanya. We could have one be Sharon. We could have one be the final sort of act, but it really is sort of how one sort of topples into the other. And I think this is the, this is the best format for the story. And, and I say this with uh, representatives of Netflix on the line, but was there any, pre you know, uh, how did that work? I mean, in that relationship, did, was there any I mean, they, was that the decision you made or I guess a collaborative decision that this is the best way of telling the story? It was a collaborative decision. I mean, there were, there were yeah. conversations, you know, about it. It's like, could we, you know, could we, do we want to do it in three? Could we hold it up in three? And, and, and it was definitely a meaningful conversation that happened. Um, it was very much a collaborative decision to go with the feature doc. Okay. Um, well, I think it's, I mean, I'm, it's, I watched it yesterday. It's still, uh, it's going to sit with me for a while. I think this was, uh, I was I'm very impressed um, and very thankful for you to make, for making this. Uh, especially as you say, it's a victim forward celebration of Sharon's life, as well as telling this incredible tale of how, um, and tragic one, obviously, of, of her life and, uh, and, uh, and how it all came to light of what her true, who her true, you know, of her true identity. And then I think, as you say, uh, goes even a little further. Uh, so, um, you know, I do highly recommend that people give this a, give this a, a watch. Uh, but uh, you're maybe not even thinking this far ahead yet, but what's next for you? Oh, there's, so I'm developing a lot of ideas right now. And, um, and there are a couple other, a couple other projects that, that are, that are in, in line to be coming out reasonably soon. So, um, I will keep you posted for sure. <laughs> but nothing yeah. you can tell us about. I know, you're right. <laughs> okay. That's, we're, we're used we'll to that around here. We'll be talking again soon though. Trust <laughs> okay. me. <laughs> okay. What we're looking for. Is it, is it, are you staying in, are you staying with true crime or are you, are you going to do other, uh. I'm Other staying with true crime. I'm definitely yeah. staying with true crime. There's just so much, there's so much richness there. There's so much, I think that we can, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated area to, to exist yeah. in for many different reasons. I mean, it's yeah. complicated to live there emotionally. It's complicated to find the right balance of telling a story. And so, so that's, you know, the complications of telling these stories are also really fascinating to me and, and doing people justice and, and telling it with the right nuance. So it's a challenge that I'm, I'm very much up for. Yeah, and, and it's certainly a calling, and so I'm th thankful that you've uh, pr pursued that calling. So I just wanted to thank you again for uh, coming on to Factual America. Uh, just to remind our listeners and viewers, we've been with uh, talking with award-winning filmmaker Sky Borgman, director and producer of Girl in the Picture. Uh, drops on Netflix on July 6th, uh, and it's an hour and 40 minutes. Well worth your time. So thanks again, Sky. It's been a pleasure talking with you. A pleasure talking with you too. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. You too. I'd like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe Graves at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show. 
And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com, and clicking on the Get in Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.